I will invite him if you would like to come back up here, and if you have any questions for him, uh, please feel free. <laughs> Good evening, Ayava Logan from the Medical University of South Carolina. I'm so excited about your first uh, article in the Science Translation Medicine Journal um, because one of my abstract, my uh, paper was on research reproducibility as well and finding in scope is how much science um, or how the term is used or not used uh, throughout. And But my um, uh, goal was really to see how librarians, as a librarian, are participating in that library research. So I wanted to know if you had librarians on your team or information specialists on your team and um, to talk a little bit more about the terminology because, again, in your paper that I found, um, it doesn't talk about the methods of that aspect at all. So uh, I, I think that uh, there's uh, plenty of opportunity for librarians to do better searches uh, for this. Uh, if you go to our uh, metrics website, uh, we are trying to compile a literature of uh, meta research. And uh, we have tried a number of searches with very different uh, search strings. And uh, we have involved uh, libra librarians also in building these searches. Um, I think that we're still missing a lot because many of these concepts have very different terminology across different fields. And they may present their, their uh, their papers in, in atypical ways, or they, they may be very typical for their field, but they're atypical for at least the field that I'm familiar with. Uh, and putting that nomenclature in some order, I think, is useful. I, I think that fields uh, uh, may use different terms to mean the same thing. Or, as I said, they may have different requirements ab about what aspects of reproducibility matter for them. So I, I think that uh, I would welcome opportunities. Anyone who wants to go to our website and come up with improvements, you're more than welcome. So uh, if we accept that most research is false, and as a neuroscientist where maybe even more than most is false, um, and certainly I think in my area there's just a lot of really false research, and you say, we really you know, we go and write NIH grants and it's to fund new research and, and, and yet we've got all this false research out there. It, it, I'm wondering what you think about an idea that, I mean, it's not, I don't know how to say it, but kind of an old idea. And Eugene Garfield used to point, emphasize the importance of writing review articles and dissecting the field. And I'm, I'm speaking more to preclinical research. Do you think that's a way that maybe, as we were, some of us were talking about earlier, the grumpy old guys ought to go and try and, and, and do that, maybe. Do you think that would help? Is that, if so, how important would that be to do? I, I think that review articles uh, and some introspection of, of any field is useful, uh, but it, it also has its caveat. So, uh, for example, I have been a very strong proponent of systematic review approaches and, and meta-analysis of existing information. But I also published a paper recently that was very critical of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And the reason for that is that um, they can also become part of the problem. Uh, so there's many fields that we have seen an exponential growth of uh, in, in factory scale, industrial scale production of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Most of them redundant, not useful, with florid uh, errors in the way that they're done uh, with uh, florid errors, even their construction about what, why are, are they doing what, what they do. Uh, and, and my estimate eventually was that only 3% of that literature, which, which supposedly is the higher level of evidence, the last frontier, and that the best chance of understanding what are we doing, only 3% of them were both correct and useful uh, at the end of the day. So I think that some fields that have not reached that level would benefit from not just more but better systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And part of making these better needs to incorporate some of that transparency. So if, if you're just trying to synthesize selectively reported information, the meta-analysis will just be a, a mega bias type of project. If you use these tools to correct the bias, to reveal the bias and then to correct it, or ideally to help scientists bring their forces together and perform primary research that is a prospective meta-analysis and it's 
primary research equals meta-analysis in that case, uh, this may be more useful. So I, I'm, I'm always in favor of, of big bird's eye views of, uh, of the literature and of, of scientific fields, but I don't want to give the impression that these are just uh, the perfect uh, measure that everything needs to be measured against. I want to thank you for coming. Um, this was really informative. So you had mentioned sharing not only the data, but detailed analytical plans from the protocols in order to increase transparency. But I've noticed that it's not uncommon for the analytical plan to be insufficient. Um, and so I was wondering your thoughts. Do you think that sharing the statistical scripts is a sufficient solution to that lack of transparency, or do you propose something else? So I think that sharing of scripts and um, codes could help in that regard. The question is, who is going to use it? Uh, but I think that some people might use it, and, and they may find it useful either for reanalyzing the existing data or for using these data in uh, future data synthesis. In some cases, it's impossible to pre-specify the exact analysis plan ahead of time. I, I have to be uh, open about this, and uh, I have talked with many senior statisticians, and they also feel the same. There are some study designs where everything can be anticipated, but many others, especially those that depend on people and other units of observation that do their own thing, uh, you know, they, they can deviate from, from what the expectation was. So it, it's not always possible to come up with an analysis plan that has a thousand different options on what am I going to do if uh, I have this drop out or this withdrawals or this lack of uh, collection of information at that site or two sites, uh, their uh, uh, phasma tometer went wrong for these dates. So, there are zillions of questions that may come up during the conduct of the study and that cannot be anticipated. And you want a seasoned methodologist, a seasoned statistician to be able to think about how do I solve or how do I correct some of these uh, problems that may lead to artifacts otherwise. At a minimum, I think we should have transparency, that that's what I could think ahead of time, and this is what my anticipated analysis plan was, and this is what didn't really go according to plan, and this is why I modified what I'm doing and ideally share uh, these scripts and codes and, and methods so that others could also take a look. It, it, it depends on whether we have the full sequence being transparent or, or just a, a beautified sequence, uh, which means that people may have tried a thousand different things, but then one thing worked and then they say, yeah, I report the statistical script, but actually this is just one out of a thousand or a million analysis that uh, predated that beautiful analysis. Hi. Uh, I'd also like to add my thanks for you coming here to the University of Utah. Um, I, um, one thing I'd wondered a little bit about your work, and I've, I've read some of it, I'm probably a small fraction, um, is um, do you think there's any grounds for um, some more optimism when, if one restricts the studies that are explicitly um, stated as pivotal studies or confirmatory studies? A lot of what's published um, is acknowledged at, at some level of being exploratory. There's some acknowledgement, sometimes kind of hidden and buried in the fine print, <laughs> but some acknowledgement that the, the research is being done in a um, discovery exploratory context. So I guess my question to you is, I mean, I'm sure you guys have looked at this issue. Does that mitigate at all the pessimism? Um, I think that if this is clear cut, then this is a giant step forward because um, you know that you need to read the results with a grain of salt. I mean, if it's exploratory, maybe there's even better some element of trying to capture what is the multiplicity that is inherent in the exploration. Sometimes even the investigators themselves cannot really describe it. I, I, I see that in my own exploratory projects that I cannot really tell you exactly how many <laughs> options uh, arose in the process. So, but at a minimum, it should be there, that that was an exploration. Uh, it means that someone used a very different perspective in interpreting these data and knows that if I want to move to the next step, I need to validate that exact observation with a new study that 
now focuses on, on particularly that particular observation that has been explored. Yeah. So, so it, it would be very helpful if we do that. And I, I, I strongly believe that we should not push people who do exploratory research to claim that what they do is not exploratory research. That, that would be a huge error, because then, then we will give a false sense of reassurance that everybody, everything was pre-thought and pre-registered. And maybe you can do that for randomized trials much of the time, but for many other types of designs, it's not possible to do. But in these meta-analyses, yes, I totally agree with all that. And, but in the meta-analyses that have been done, the, 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 um, which have tried to evaluate rates of false positive rates, for example, um, are, are we trying to, to your knowledge, have they tried to sift out and remove these exploratory studies in those evaluations? Probably not. Obviously, meta-analysis are done for very diverse types of studies, and some meta-analysts may have very stringent criteria for eligibility and may ask for some design safeguards and, and say that the others are lower quality studies. In, in my experience, most meta-analysis don't have this type of limitations, but it, it can vary from team to team and from application to application. My personal bias when I try to look at a field and the evidence is to just try to look at all the evidence mm -hmm. and then try to sort out if some quality or design or, or other uh, perspective characteristics do make a difference in the results. But, but other people may be more restrictive in their approach. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for, for sharing your recent research with us here and really for all of your research that's opened our eyes over the last 10 years to the defects in the science system that most of us have, have been participants in. Uh, it's been a long day with a lot of um, evidence and, and discussion that casts a pessimistic light on the work that we do. And when I talk about this, uh, I was the VP for research here at the university until July. When I talk about this topic, I usually try to throw in a quotation from you from a profile that the Atlantic Monthly did in 2010, I think it was at the end of the article, you said something to the effect that people should not be too disappointed by the difficulty of doing this, that biomedical research is a low yield enterprise. And I'm certainly, it certainly doesn't offset the challenges and problems, but I wonder if, if you still feel that way or have anything you might want to say on that topic. Thank you for your very kind words. I, I think that um, e even though much of what I describe might be reason for people to be pessimistic, eventually I am an optimist. And I, I do believe that what we do is worth it. And uh, science is the best thing that has happened to humans. Uh, we just have to, to be pragmatic and, and realistic about how much we can achieve. And there, there will be a few major successes now and then. Uh, but for the, the vast majority of us, uh, probably we will not discover a, a huge uh, advance that will save millions of lives or will uh, help humans uh, uh, go to, to Mars in two years. Uh, so I, I think this is perfectly fine. The, uh, science is a, is a collective enterprise. It's a communal project with openness and sharing. And we have 20 million scientists all of them contribute towards these big successes. Maybe some uh, among us will be more lucky, uh, and obviously they will also be per persistent in what they do and, and smart. I'm not saying that it's just luck. But I think that the, the credit for whatever progress is made and progress is made should go to the entire community. So if, if you dilute the successes across these 20 million scientists, everybody should be proud of, of what they do and not be disappointed because of uh, of failures. I think that my career has been a long string of failures, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> um, with regard to meta-analysis, and we don't typically exclude based on quality of the study, I guess I'm finding myself wondering if we should. I've thought about that, you know, sometimes when I've been working on things, uh, and I mean, we grade it, but Again, any thoughts on that? This, this is a hotly debated topic, and I, I will give you a personal bias perspective. As I said, I'm more of the school of 
inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness. And I say that because if you include everything, then you have the opportunity to, to explore uh, what has gone wrong. Uh, and it could be very manifest quality problems, but it could be other more subtle problems. The problem with quality is that in, in the current environment uh, where so limited information is, is available in, in the real dimensions of road data and analysis plan and protocol and code and software, we have to trust what we see at the surface of things. And it could be that a study that looks um, perfect on, on paper, you know, four pages of uh, that printed report, uh, may be completely dismal for obvious or not obvious reasons. And it could be that a study that has a zillion quality problems that we say, how could they do that? Maybe all these problems cancel out. And uh, five biases move the effect in one direction, and another f seven biases move the effect in the other direction. And the result that they got was complete perfection in terms of, of what the true effect size is. So I, 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 I have found myself very uh, much in need of mapping quality but not excluding studies because of, uh, of quality, because it's, it's very difficult. And, and, and then the, there's another complicating factor. If, if, for many types of design, there's so many quality scales out there that we have empirical data that some studies that are rated as being pretty high uh, in terms of quality with some scale, they're rated as being mediocre with some other scale. Thank you.